Hey, what's up, bookworms? Today, I'd like to welcome musician, Viking reenactor, and best-selling author of The Faithful and the Fallen, Of Blood and Bone, and soon his first novel outside of the Banished Lands, The Bloodsworn Saga, Mr. John Gwynn. John, thank you so much. It feels like I've been talking to you forever now about actually reading these books, and I know that I've been just like blowing your Twitter up for like the last like three or four months, just kind of hyping the hell out of the series. But uh, let me get my fanboying out of the way here. Faithful <laughs> the Fallen, I keep uh, selling to people is like the hidden gem of the modern fantasy uh, era because I just I don't feel like enough people are talking about this book, but it seems like everyone who reads it absolutely loves it. And so if I have helped in any way to get more eyes on this product, uh, I am really really excited about that. And uh, I don't really know what else to say except I love the series. And I mean, no shock, I'm onto the next one right now, about halfway through that one, and I'm enjoying right it every bit as much. So uh, just first off, I just want to say thank you for writing. Such a wonderful series, and then for joining me here on the channel. How are you doing? No, it's, it's my pleasure to be here, Mike. Thanks for the invite, mate. Um, yeah, I'm doing okay. It's a bit warm here in the UK at the moment, but um, which we're, we're not really used to, but I'm doing the right things. Yeah, see, I'm and in Houston. Houston. It's 114 <laughs> degrees out here, so we're, we're used to it. <laughs> yeah, you are. You must be used to it. No, it's, it's a bit of a shock to our system, but it's, it's hot for us. Well, but I'm glad I, to be here. I owe much of this to uh, our guy, Petrick. I'm sure you know who that is. He's been like your personal hype man on Goodreads. And I've always know, kind, of, I've kind of always aligned with his reviews. And what he, it was when he told me, I'm a big Joe Abercrombie fan. And when he said, hey, this guy is like the perfect mix between Brandon Sanderson and Joe Abercrombie. You've got to check out John. And he just would not leave me alone about this. Okay. And I bought all seven of your books before I even read one because just what he told me, I was like, That's crazy. all right, I can tell that this is going to be an author that I'm into. What I didn't expect is to have these big 700 page novels be able to just burn through them as quick as I did. And I mean, I, I don't know what it is about your style that doesn't seem like it doesn't feel like there's any kind of uh, world building, like anything you're holding back from us, but it doesn't seem like you got 200 pages on how they brew a cup of wine, you know? And I, I as a reader, appreciate that. Is that something you kind of aimed for when you wrote the series? Uh, yeah, I suppose it is. I didn't want to spend too much time, you know, just, just traveling aimlessly around the Banished Lands. So whenever there is traveling, and there has to be in an epic world, you know, your, your characters need to move from A to B. Um, that, that's a nice time to, to do the world building, but I always want to have it kind of hooked into something else that's going on. So it, it feels like there's a, you know, there's a na still a narrative drive going on. Perfect. Uh, that's just, to me, I just couldn't believe how fast I was reading through those. And um, I mean, cause it took me, you know, a year to read through Wheel of Time, you know, <laughs> those are big old beefy books. But uh, I have some viewer, uh, some of my viewers, some of your reader questions here because I'm really bad at coming up with questions besides just being like, hey, yeah, your series is really awesome. So uh, I opened it up to them, and they have some just, you know, the greatest hits here, questions that you've probably answered a million times. So, so humor me here. Uh, the first one, yeah. obviously, what were your writing influences growing up and maybe even more modern? Yeah, I mean, well, that's, you know, probably a, the boring answer, really, because my it's, it's Tolkien first and foremost above everything. Um, I mean, the, the very first fantasy I read was when I was, I was a child at school, seven or eight years old, and um, my, my teacher started reading a book called The Book of Three by Lloyd Alexander, um, which is, uh, is fantasy. Is that Disney made a film out of it called The Black Cauldron. Mm, okay. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. But, it, it, but um, as an eight-year-old child, I, that hooked me. I just loved it. It was very um, based on Welsh, Welsh mythology um, and uh, magic pigs. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and I just remember being hooked from that moment on. And then my sister loaned me The Hobbit, and it was, you know, that that was it from there. It's a slippery slope of ring wraiths and magic rings and talking dragons. So that that's when it all started. Um, and then Tolkien was a, was a big influence, and you know the writers of the day, um, Narnia, of course. Um, but I think as it grew, I think my the people I'd always say now looking back as my biggest influences are Tolkien. Bernard Cornwell and David Gemmel, um, you know those those three guys are on a pedestal for me. Um, and I think you know Tolkien has just kind of nailed the epic side of things. Uh, Gemmel, his flawed characters and and um, and combat and just real people. I think 
was something that was fresh to me when I first read Legend, his first book. It's the first book I stayed up all night to read because I just couldn't stop reading. You know, it's a real page turner. And then Bernard Cornwell, um, you know, his his uh, his trilogy on Arthur, King Arthur, is just one of my most beloved series ever. I love love that trilogy and his his combat and his characters. So then come, if I could even come close to write some, writing something that blended those three guys, uh, you know, that that um, that make me a very happy man. So what you're telling me is I need to read the Saxon Tales for sure. Yes, you do. Uh, I, I love the show, which I'll talk to you about here in a second. Yeah, it's uh, such a great You know, obviously that, that influence has actually kind of shown through because when I started reviewing your books, a lot of people who had read them had said, you need to check out David Gimmel because it's a lot of that same style. And I ha I've had Legend on my Kindle for, you know, as long as I've had it, never really got to it. But since I started talking about your books, a lot of people have actually recommended those. So uh, oh, really great. It seems like yeah, yeah, that I mean, influence he, definitely shines through. He's one. Uh, yeah, let's see, he's who, one. who is your favorite current working fantasy author? So I guess that rules out uh, <laughs> Mr. Rothfuss and Mr. Martin since they're not actually working right now. But uh, your favorite, <laughs> your favorite modern fantasy author is still writing. Oh my word! I mean, there, I've, I have a few. There are so many great writers going at the moment. Um, you know, the guy that I is that I'll buy and read anything that he puts out is um, Christian Cameron. I love his writing. Um, although he, he write, he's so prolific, you know, it's hard to keep up with the amount of stuff he puts out. But he write, writes both fantasy and historical, so, and I like both, both sides of, of that fence. I love his writing. Mark Lawrence, I'm a big fan of his, his work. Um, I love the, the um, Red Sister trilogy. Really, really love that. Uh, who, who else? There's, well, I'm reading Peter McLean at the moment, um, Priest of Lies, which is just great. I heard that's very um, grim darky. So yeah, I, I is, have that yeah, on my radar. I mean, I, I do like Grimdark. Joe Abercrombie, of course, is um, you know, he he's he's in a league of his own. I think Joe, yeah, his characterization. It, <laughs> there are very few books you can read, and you read a piece of dialogue, and you know who the character is without having to to, to, to read the name. You know, he he's just nailed it. So, um, you know, there, there's. Those are the guys I, I mentioned off the top of my head. There's a whole load of others. I have the Trader's Sun Cycle, but I haven't dipped into it yet. So I'm glad to hear that actual recommendation. That sounds, that sounds like a good time for sure. Uh, yeah. Here's another one. Who is your favorite non-fantasy author of all time? Well, I guess Bernard Cornwell would um, sneak into there. Uh, um, it's historical. His historical. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good way. See, I expect you to go with something sci-fi there. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. And you already answered what book you're reading right now. Okay, here's a, a non non book question: Vikings or The Last Kingdom? The Last Kingdom. Now, oh, see that to me, that's like asking which one of my kids I love more. <laughs> I love both yeah, yeah. So much. I, I enjoy both series, but um, the last the Last Kingdom has Uhtred, so that's it. Mm -hmm. It's a no brainer for me. Uhtred, son of Uhtred, is something I I, I shout yeah. at my kids all the time. Uh, all right, so. <laughs> I have actually made a joke a while back that I saw that now famous photo of you with the axe and the dogs. And same thing happened with Sebastian de Castell is anytime I see an author like holding weapons, I'm like, well, I got to read this guy's stuff because they're serious about it. But that very famous photo now amongst your fans, uh, I believe one of the dogs name is Valor, but the people want to know what are the dogs names? Okay. Actually the, t the two dogs in that photo, they've, they have both, they both died now, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, that that photo got taken in 2011, early 2012, something like that. And yeah, um, so the the dog to Bordeaux, his name was Hammer. Who uh, you may have come across that name yeah, yeah, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I named the bear after him, and uh, the Akita, um, the dog that looks like a wolf in that photo, was um, Trinity. Oh, see now I was curious. Yeah. Here I was hoping it was Storm. <laughs> <laughs> That's Storm, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so I mean, obviously, doing the Viking reenactment, you have all the, the gear and stuff. But I see people saw you with that axe, and they're like, "Well, this is a guy I got to read." But yeah, that, I figured that was an old photo since you didn't have the uh, the, the Viking beard yet. So that, that that's pretty. Yeah, cool. yeah, and I was about four stone lighter then as well. 
All right, I can't, yeah, I can't, I, I don't even want to talk about stuff like that. Uh, I, I can't take credit for this question because I'm trying not to be that guy, but I got this one a lot. If you were asked to ghostwrite and complete one of the following two series, which would it be, King Killer Chronicles or A Song of Ice and Fire? <laughs> oh, I mean, um, if I had the choice, <laughs> I'd go for A Song of Ice and Fire. Right. I, when I read your series, I said, wow, you know, guys, quit whining about A Song of Ice and Fire not getting written and, and read this, because I think you'll find everything that you're looking for out of, out of Faithful and the Fallen. So that's, yeah, I figured that was going to be your answer. Well, that's great to feel like that, Mike. Thank you. Uh, I mean, um, I, yeah, I guess yeah. you're a fan uh, of, the, of the books, right? Yeah, yeah, huge fan. Love it. Awesome. So yeah. uh, why don't you call George and be like, hey, you need some help there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is one I've gotten a lot, uh, and, and I, 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 asked, I actually asked uh, Joe Abercrombie the same thing all the time, and he just says, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really make sense financially, but a lot of people want to know if you'd ever consider a con or a book signing in the States. Oh, I mean, I'd, I'd love to. Um, it, it's not about the finances. It's that, that um, my daughter Harriet's profoundly disabled. Right. And... Um, I don't really travel too too much or too far. Uh, it's because uh, you know I'm her her care along with my wife, right. and so I don't really um, be too far away. She suffers from epilepsy, and um, just that you know, she she needs twenty four seven care. So uh, it 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 mean getting a Gwyn bus uh, and all of us flying out there, which you know that'd be fun. Yeah, but I, um, I don't I miss my kids too pregnant. much. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the reason really why I don't do too much traveling. All right, Joe just said his books weren't popular enough in the States to, uh, to, to justify coming out to the States. And I was just like, well, why not, guys? Come on, people, Americans, get, get it together here. Uh, what kind of music do you listen to while you write? And is it Iron Maiden? <laughs> <laughs> no, when I write, um, I, write I, I usually listen to, to soundtrack type stuff. Uh, anything that's uh, kind of too too modern or really, you know, has um, it's even got lyrics in, I tend to get distracted. So I like my, my music writing to be a bit background. Um, so, you know, the classic albums you'd think of when I was writing The Faithful and the Fallen, stuff like The Lord of the Rings, you know, Gladiator, Last of the Mohicans, that kind of stuff. I've got into more um, obscure music, really, for the new series. I'm listening to a lot more Norse um kind of folk music, so by bands like Wardruna um, um, and Dan Viking and, and people like that who you've probably never heard of because I hadn't heard of them until uh, I a little a while ago. I listen to a lot of soundtracks while I read, and actually, honestly, I listened to the Viking soundtrack when I read Faithful in the Fall, and I thought that it fit really, really well. Uh, so okay. I'll be very interested to see with this, this Bloodsworn stuff, which I'm going to ask you about here in a little bit. But uh, a couple more here. I already know the answer because I asked you on Twitter when I was re just really just getting into this. Has anyone reached out to you at all about acquiring adaptation rights of any of your stories? No. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. No, no, nothing no. I just thought with this explosion of interest in fantasy that, that, that for someone would have at least like, you know, dropped you an email or something. Man, that's... Yeah. No. Guys, we got to do a Kickstarter and get a movie studio together here. All right. Yeah, I live in hope, you know. But I was what, what, writing, getting published was a daydream, so sure, you, never sure. you never know. Uh, this one is from me, and this question is, how the hell do you write so fast? Because I rant all the time about these very successful fantasy authors who just – writing doesn't seem to be their passion, and yet you're pumping out one 700-page novel every year. And I think Stephen King – uh, Stephen King famously said his method is hell or high water. When he's in writing mode, he's getting six pages done per day, right. no matter what. So do you have a process kind of like this to meet those goals, or have you just like mapped this out so much before you even start that you just it just comes natural? N neither of those, really. I, to be honest, I don't really know. I just I don't really have a um, a set routine. Uh, you know, I'm not disciplined enough to, to have set writing times. And my, my family setup doesn't really allow for right. that. It's a bit crazy. So um, I just I just get stuck in when I've got the time. You know, um, sit sit at my desk, put my headphones on, put the tunes on, and uh, and hope that it flows. I've never had anything like writer's block or anything like that. I, I never I've never looked at a blank page and just not knowing what to write. I always find it not a problem to get into 
my world once I sit down and start writing it's just finding the time to do it which which obviously I've, I've I managed to do somehow but it's there's no really no real rhyme or reason to, to how I get it done I just just squeeze the time in as and when I can and it's well, worked out all right so yeah we appreciate it I appreciate I mean it's it's great when you uh you know you're just you're so sick of series that won't get finished and then you discover two series that are already done you're like oh great this is great I don't have to wait so uh you know yeah. We'll talk about Bloodsworn here in a minute, and I'll be the first one I actually have to wait for. But uh, uh, let's get into some actual faithful and the following questions here. And I'm kind of going vague, non-spoiler, because I still kind of want people to read this series so I can talk to more people about it. Sure, yeah. But when you began Faithful and the Fallen, did you plan it to be four books from Go, or did it kind of grow or shrink from your original plan? It was, I did, did think it, would, it was going to be four books or five books. Um, I wasn't quite sure whether it be five until I got to um, Ruin. Uh, and that's when it kind of tightened up a bit for me. It still could I still could have kind of, it could have, Wrath could have turned into two books, but I wanted to keep it a bit tighter, you know. I didn't want there to be any, um, any, any fat there. Ho hopefully there isn't, you know, I wanted it to feel like a fast-paced ending. So, yeah, it, the four works well. And I had four in my mind from the beginning, but I wasn't quite sure whether it would it would grow from there. Yeah, and the, the ending to ruin. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, how hard was it to get published for you? I mean, like, how long were you sitting in the store? I know that you have your. Uh, is it Edward that is your your alpha reader, basically? Yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah. My my all my sons read my books and my wife. Yeah. yeah. And but so, it, how it, long it, did you sit on the story before you know a publisher actually picked it up? Do you know it was um uh, it was a bit of a fairy tale. Right, really. I, I, I was when I when I when I wrote Malice. Um, I didn't write it with the, in, the thought of being published initially. It was just a hobby. I was just writing it for, for for my children, my wife, and for my own pleasure. I'd never written creatively before Malice, so that was the first thing I sat down and you know, had a go at writing as a hobby. And as it as I was getting towards finishing it, and my my children had read it, and then. I let a few friends read it, and they were like, oh, you know, this isn't bad. So I thought, well, I'll send it off to an agent and see see what happens, uh, which I did. And uh, and he liked it, and asked, um, we had a conversation, so I became his client. And then he he sent it out to the kind of the big five publishers in the UK and said, this was just before Christmas, I think, in 2010, uh, it's probably second week in December. And he said, "Don't expect to hear anything back because publishing winds down. Don't don't expect to hear anything back this side of um, Christmas. You know, because publishing winds down now, and they'll all be back in the office and ready to go in January." So I thought, "Well, that's cool." But he gave me a ring on um, it was on the last day of school before the Christmas holiday. So, and said, you, "You've got an offer from Pam McMillan." Wow, and that was it. Yeah, it was, uh, so it's it was all very smooth, really. Um, and I wasn't at that time. I wasn't really online in social media or anything, so I didn't really have any clue on on what to expect. It, it's yeah, it's, it was all a bit of a shock. Really. Th that explains why you're so good on social media with engaging with your audience. Because I I don't know if maybe many authors know this, but authors that engage with us peasants, we absolutely we'll just cut them to the front of our line when it comes to reading stories because it really feels like you give a damn, you know, there's, there's been a few authors who it's been like, you know, Hey, don't meet your heroes because they're usually not very nice. And so uh, to me, it's very refreshing <laughs> that even before I even read your series, you were engaging with me. So that really helped kind of move you up there. So uh, maybe it's the fact that you got that late start on social media, you know, you haven't become disillusioned. Yeah, thank you. I just think if if people can be bothered to to spend their money and read read a, a book or two of mine, then then the least I can do is um is say hello and answer any questions online. That's, well, awesome. that's what I try to do. That's awesome. Uh, so, so what I kind of said earlier, kind of what how Patrick sold it to me and kind of me. I, I I love grim dark fantasy. I love traditional PG family. I mean, obviously I'm a big Tolkien guy as well. I grew up on him and C.S. Lewis uh, and Terry Brooks. So I mean, I was I was all about the you know, the traditional fantasy. But when I got, when I first discovered A Song of Ice and Fire and then First Law, I got really into the whole gray characters and stuff like that. Just the absolute stuff that make you squirm while you read it. 
And I've said yeah. I felt like your story is a fine line in between because it's, you know, you got heads flipping off and stuff like that. It's got the violence. It's got its grit, but it's never quite, you know, down there in the muck with like a first law or, or, a, <laughs> or, or, or broken empire or something like that, where it's just like, wow, I feel like kind of like nauseous reading this. Uh, do you think, did you struggle with ever wanting your story to kind of go lean one way, kind of like either more PG or more grim dark, or did you always have that fine line in between you went to roll with? No, that's always what I aimed for, I think. Oh, because um, The Faith from the Fallen was it was kind of my love song to the fantasy I grew up on. You know, it's it was kind of my tip of the hat to, to all those guys. Excuse me. But I wanted to um, to blend it with a kind of a, a contemporary feel. Um, uh, and what, so I, that was always in my mind that I wanted to try and find that line be, between it, it, it feeling almost like old school fantasy, but with a, a modern twist and take on it. You know, I set out to do that. Yeah, right wrong. I think a lot of the feedback I got was like, people were like, you know, the word trope gets thrown around and people that's become like a naughty word yeah. in the fantasy genre. And I was like, and they're like, and this guy's doing it and it doesn't feel stale at all. It feels like really fresh. So yeah, I, I could definitely see, you know, anytime you deal with the farm boy that leaves home, people are going to be like, ah, I've heard this story before. But uh, I felt yeah. like there was enough of a change to the way that you did it that uh, I really, I really liked it. But the, the, like I said, when I first got into it, I was like, well, I'm not sure this is quite so grim dark. And I got to like the first battle. I'm like, well, I mean, there are heads flipping off everywhere. <laughs> He's writing about gore quite a bit here. So I don't really know what that fine line between grim dark and, uh, you know, just dark gritty fantasy or something like that. What would you, what would you clear? What would you classify it as? Do you know what? I don't know. There's so many subgenres <laughs> now. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the big reason is because character death. Now, let me be straight with you here. I think even George R. R. Martin thinks she might be a little bloodthirsty. Okay, but the question is, do you struggle as an author? Do you struggle with killing any of your characters? It's just kind of a means to an end. You know from go which characters aren't going to make it or not, or is it actually one of those where you had a tough time, like actually getting through a, a certain character death? Oh no, it's it's always hard to. I find it always hard to to kill my points of view um, unless they're particularly unpleasant characters and, and in that case I really enjoy it <laughs> right. but, uh, yeah but no no it's, it's never easy I mean I don't want to you know I'll, I don't want to give any spoilers but wait so I'll, I won't mention names but you know there are character deaths that, um, that were a real struggle to write and like, part of me didn't want to you know but a lot of that stuff I think it's I mean I can't it all I can tell you is my, how, I, how it feels for me as a writer. And it, a lot of that stuff is a, is a kind of a gut instinct when you're in the scene. Um, and you, the way I approach it is I just try to be true to the characters, true to what's going on without really having too much of a, uh, a set agenda in place. I've got event, events that I work towards with my characters, but I try and let them find their own way. And um, sometimes if they get, you know, a knife in the back or in the heart or along the way, then, then what, what can I say? The banished lands isn't a safe place to live. <laughs> right. Right. It, it, every so many times I'm like, all right, this guy's doing this so much and he can't really surprise me. And then there'll be one. I'll be like, Oh my God, this guy. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, your characters, they, they definitely seem to kind of be very clearly good or bad. Right. And the thought process behind giving us, um, POV chapters, uh, maybe not so good characters, what were you thinking there? I guess basically what I'm saying is what kind of monster writes a POV chapter for Rafe, you know? <laughs> I, mean, that, that, I just find that more interesting hmm. when you see both sides of the coin. And, and I think, you know, everyone's the hero of their, their, own, their story. own story, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know? So, so these characters, I, I, I never wanted to write two dimensional, you know, mustache twirling bad guys. So, uh, so that my, my, I try, I strive to write characters that feel realistic and rounded and have a, have a, a kind of a, their own internal um, code that they will have their own um, rationale for why they do the things they do um, so, so they feel realistic. That, that, that's what I try to do. So, and I think it makes it more interesting when you're seeing both si two sides or you know, all the sides of a conflict whether it's a battle or it's a, a um, council meeting or whatever, I just I find that interesting. 
Yeah, and plus when you get you made you made Rafe a dog lover, it was hard for me to like not like you know hate him anymore. So it was it was tough. It was tough. Speaking of that, speaking of that, first, thank you for creating Storm. Uh, I is finally surpassed Ghost as my favorite fantasy sidekick beast. Wow. Animals are a huge part, really, of both series that I've read so far. And is that just because you're an animal lover, or was there some kind of influence there for you? Um, it's pro- that's probably it, first and foremost. You know, I am a big animal lover. I've always had dogs. Um, yeah, but I never cared about birds until I read your books. <laughs> I love crows. <laughs> I don't know. Crow- I mean, the crows have always featured in, the, in a lot of it. Uh, that fantasy I've read, I think um, that book I mentioned, the book of three, has got a talking crow in. And one of the other kind of my childhood loves as a book was Arabelle's Raven, um, Mortimer. I don't know if you, you've ever come across that series. Um, but I, I remember we had a, a TV program in the UK when I, when I was um, a boy called Jack and Ori, which was basically somebody sitting in front of a camera reading a book. And it was on, you know, after, when you get home from school and you sit down and put TV on, mum's making dinner, and you watch TV for a little bit before you um, get, get stuck into dinner and then your homework or whatever. And one of the stories was um, Arabelle's Raven, it's called, and, and that's always stuck with me with this very naughty, cheeky crow. Actually, it worked, a raven. Crows, ravens, you know. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so like, yeah, I can't believe that this guy's got like talking crows and then, you know, maybe one of those crows don't make them and people are like, no, why? So it's like, oh, I thought you didn't like talking crows. So, yeah, you're obviously, obviously doing something uh, very right there. I believe you used to teach at uh, Brighton University, correct? Yeah, yeah. All right, so obviously you're a big fan of history, teaching and stuff like that. There's obviously some uh, Viking and Nordic themes a lot like that. But I also feel like there's a little bit of Scottish and Irish in there. I might be off on that one, but kind of really what was your inspiration? Cause I'm guessing just, just historical stuff that you're really into were kind of your inspiration for creating this world. Is there any really heavy theme or anything or any kind of land or anything or moment in history that you really like, like we said that game of uh, game of Thrones was or song of ice of fire was kind of like war of roses. Is there any kind of like yeah. events or anything in history or just a time period that really was the basis for the Vanished Lands? Yeah, a bit, a bit of both, really. I always, I mean, I've, I've all, I grew up loving fantasy and mythology, you know, all the Greek stuff and um, King Arthur stuff, and also loving history. You know, I, I love reading about history. Um, so that was always going to be. In what I in what I do, I and mean, the Banished Lands for me was was a kind of a historical slash mythological Western Europe, um, kind of the Dark Ages Western Europe. In fact, I think for the for um the Faithful and the Fallen, the inspirations really the main inspiration was Celtic mythology, um, you know Irish mythology. Um, the the language I use for the giants giantish that that's actually Irish Gaelic. You know, oh, okay. um, so, so that's that's um, a big big part of the Banished Lands, and then you, you find the world, the part of the um, world that characters like uh, Nefer come from, is, is inspired by ancient Rome and ancient Greece. It's a kind of a Greco-Roman world, and that's reflected in um, what they wear, in their names. For example, um, Veridus is Latin for faithful. You know, and that, that you, uh, that's all kind of seeded into the world where there's this basis on, on history or mythology. Um, that's kind of uh, the building blocks for, for the Banished Lands. Yeah, you explained the whole name thing to me when I was asking you if I was pronouncing Kywin right. And uh, cause yeah, a yeah, lot of people were telling me that the audiobook guy was saying Cohen, and I was like, "How are you getting Cohen out of that?" <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, but, uh, it's a funny thing with fantasy names, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah. I got asked that question today. Actually, someone on Inst- Instagram up messaged and said that you know, how do you pronounce Cohen? And because it's a dead language, it's Celtic. It's a Celtic yeah. name, but you know, it's kind of open to interpretation because you know, we, even now we've got the word Celtic, but you can also pronounce it Celtic. You've got, we've got a football team in Scotland called um, Celtic. And we have the Boston Celtics so you, out here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can kind of choose, really, which one you prefer, the hard K or the, the hard C, which is pronounced as a K, or the soft C, which is pronounced as an S. But I try to be consistent. So if you're going to call Kywin Cywin, 
then you have to call Corban Sorban. Yeah, right. And okay. Camlin Samlin, you know, it's, that's that's the kind of rules I've set myself to try and be consistent with with these old languages. All right, as vague as I can be here, I'm going to tell you that my favorite scene in the series is Corbin versus Summer and the whole running mount running mount part. That to me was just like the finest chapter in the whole series. So I got to know as you. As the writer, what was the scene that you had the most fun or just the most memorable scene that you think that you wrote? I mean, that one is definitely right up there. There's some scenes you write and you, you, um, you always hope that it comes out all right. But uh, there's, there's, you know, there's this small number of scenes where you kind of get a hair standing up on your neck feeling when you're writing it that gives you an idea that this is coming out all right, at least for me. And that one was was right up there. I think the end of ruin was another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that chapter breaks people. Just letting you know. <laughs> there was there was a scene in Valor. Um, I, I try not to give away spoilers, but where the central gang had been separated, mm. and they, where they all came together again in a castle in the snow. I don't know if that. Um, you can figure it out from there, but that was a scene that, I'll, that I really enjoyed writing. In Malice, um, there was a scene where Storm was central to helping find someone, and then there was a bit of a scrap. Yeah. Uh, that scene. Read this, was, guys, and you'll know what all these moments are. They're great. They're, they're yeah, I'm trying great. to be very coded here. <laughs> now, I hope I'm saying his name right. I said Makin. Now, other people say Maquin. I say Maquin. Uh, but that was my favorite character because, to me, I felt like he had the best arc in the story because I seriously thought he was just kind of a throwaway character to a certain POV character in the first book. I thought he was just, ah, he's just going to Obi-Wan himself. And the fact that this character stayed around for quite some time and I thought had the best growth over the whole novel and it was impossible not to root for this guy. And for me, character over everything else. You can have the greatest world. You can have the greatest terminology and battles and stuff. If your characters, if I don't really relate with them or don't care, I'm kind of out on it. But Mackin's journey, or McKean, I say it wrong myself too. McKean's journey in this, I, I just thought it was absolutely the best arc that I had seen in fantasy in quite some time. So what about you? What was your favorite character that you wrote? If you, I know this is like trying to pick one of your favorite kids here probably, but what would you say was your favorite character, even if it was just a favorite character to write in, in, in Faithful and the Fallen? Yeah, I mean, I pronounced him Maquin, which okay. is, but I've heard various versions, and I don't think you know it, it's fine. However, you want to pronounce it, really. He, I mean, he was definitely my, one of my favourite guys to write. I, I, I always enjoyed writing any scene that Brynner was in as well, even though she wasn't the POV. I, I, I just always enjoy enjoyed writing her character. Um. So yeah, I mean it's 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 a toss up. Matt Quinn is probably the one I enjoyed writing the most if I had if if I had to choose. Corban, of course, is kind of he's the anchor of the whole story. So you know, he's a very important character to me. I've heard a lot of people say of, that, that Corbin was kind of like Captain America. He's super important, but he's nobody's favorite. And I was like, I don't think that he's yeah. nobody's favorite, but he's definitely the glue that held everybody together. I think him and Barry. Yeah. 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 Uh, is there any chance that we will ever visit the Banished Lands again? Now, be it a prequel, maybe the first God War or something like that, or maybe the events. I think what a lot more people want is, is, is the events between Wrath and A Time of Dread. Is there any chance that'll ever happen? Even if it's just like a novella or a short story or anything, will we ever see Corbin in the gang again? I mean, it's, it's definitely a possibility, for sure. It's, it's on my mind quite a lot. It's something that I'd like to, I'd really like to do. Um, certainly, that time period between Wrath and the Time of Dread, I'd like, I'd like to write some, maybe some short stories or standalone, something like that. Um, you know, I mean, I've had a chat with my agent about it, and and she thinks it's a cool idea. She she'd be up for me doing something like that, and my publishers would as well. It's just about finding the time, mm -hmm. really. It's it's making the time to do it because I've, obviously I'm I've, I'm contracted to three books for the Blood Swarm. Um, which has got, you know, you have to prioritize that. So when I get writing time, I, I'll do that. And then if I've got anything spare, 
hopefully I will. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm ahead of, head of, head of my timetable for the blood storm. So you never know. I might get some time at the end of it. That where I can, uh, excellent, excellent news. <laughs> Uh, before I move on to Bloodsworn here, uh, a couple of things. Another person commented that uh, you know illustrated editions are becoming very popular now, and the fact that it's almost impossible, at least here in the states, to find your series on hardcover unless you want to pay like a thousand dollars per book. Uh, if there was ever like yeah. some sort of re-release or something like that, is it possible that we could get a illustrated edition? Because I think everybody wants to see giants riding bears, uh, but <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I think it's because <laughs> your artwork on your series is just stunning, and so I think so many people just want like a, an illustrated edition of your book. And people are saying they would be more than willing to donate to a Kickstarter if you wanted to do this. You know, Michael J. Sullivan's has so much success with his uh, with his Kickstarters. That is, is that anything you'd ever even register for you an illustrated edition of any type? I mean, it's something I'd love. Is I've always just left that side of things to my publishers because, um, you know, I'm I, I I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to to self publishing. <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm right. just an adult, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I could learn those new tricks. I know um, Michael J. Sandelman is is um he, he's very skillful at uh, at all that whole skill set, you know. But, but I wouldn't know where to start being completely honest with you but it is something that i would love to see so you might maybe you started something here mike all right about about the the art on these books everybody loves them not just because they're just simple i mean, I mean to me a fantasy novel if it has a weapon or a dragon on it i'm i'm interested right I'm, I'm i'm the target demo there will you be using the same artist for your covers for uh for the bloodsworn saga right um so the short answer is no, oh, no. um yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Because I have a new publisher for this new series. So, oh, that's you're um, doing Orbit now, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think the idea is because obviously those, even though they were two separate series, the Faithful and the Fallen End of Blood and Bone, they were very closely linked. You know, it's they're really you can read that you can can read of Blood and Bone without having read the Faithful and the Fallen. I kind of think of it as a bit like reading the Lord of the Rings without reading the Silmarillion, you know, um, but I think it's a deeper experience for the reader if you read The Faith and the Fallen first and then of Blood and Bone. And because of that, the, the, the covers were still, there was a kind of a common theme between the first series and the second series to just to kind of visually show that link between the two series. But because this is a, you know, a new, the new series is a new world, new characters, um, something completely different. I think the, the thinking uh -huh. of it is to, and I agree really, is to have a, a, something that feels different and mm. fresh. Makes sense. Mm. But, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, hopefully you like it. We've had a lot of chats about cover art. I haven't seen any drafts yet. but um, um, As long as it's weapons, um, I think people will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Bloodsworn Saga, three book deal with Orbit. Book one is titled The Dragon Unchained. And I believe you've already turned it into the publisher, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's well on, on the road to being, um, to being the finished article. It's, uh, so it, it's called The Bloodsworn Saga. Book one, that was my kind of penciled in title, just so I could have a title as The Dragon Unchained. But that has changed. Okay. Um, yeah, we've, well, I've, there's, so I've, um, there is a new title, but it hasn't been greenlit by everybody gotcha. that it needs to be greenlit by. So I, I can't. It, I'll get in a lot of trouble if I okay. <laughs> blurt it out. Now. I understand. But I think it's it, you know I think it's great and it um, it sums up the story well. Um, but so yeah, so it's uh, I, I just call the first book Bloodsworn One until we've, we've got the new title. All right. Well, as briefly or as long-winded as you want, the floor is yours here. What can you tell us about the story for uh, Bloodsworn? Since this is going to be a completely new world from you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um it's like playing in a new sandbox for me. Really, I've I've really enjoyed writing it. It feels um just giving me a new lease of life. I think feel very. I feel very fresh in this new world. It's it's um it's been a lot of fun writing it. It's it's really me diving into my love of Norse mythology. So um, it feels very Norse. There's touches of Norseness in um, the Faithful and the Fallen in the Banished Lands, but this is really inspired by Beowulf. Um, you know the, the epic poem of a mercenary band of monster hunters and Ragnarok, 
the final battle between the gods where they will die. And um, there's this wonderful passage in the Poetic Edda, um, which is a kind of a collection of old Scandinavian poems, uh, mostly about Norse mythology. And it, this, and it's in some, a part that's called the Voluspa. That was, just, that was the name of a CRS that was giving this prophecy about the end of the world, about Ragnarok. And literally in the last few lines, they talk about um, the dragon that was uh, locked up beneath um, Yggdrasil, the world tree, in, in the chambers underground beneath, beneath Yggdrasil, being set free and unleashed upon the world um, in the aftermath of Ragnarok. And then the last line is kind of like, and so it all began again. Um, building towards a second Ragnarok. And that was the starting point, really, for, well, that was the seed for this, the whole, the whole thing that's become the Bloodsworn Saga. So, um, so yeah, so it's very Norse, it's got monster hunting mercenaries in it, uh, the gods, the gods are all dead, um, but their offspring live on, and their offspring have got their, um, you know, they, they have the, the, God's bloodline in them, so they have some of the qualities of the dead gods, and all the dead gods were kind of animal based. So there's there was the wolf god, the snake, the um, the dragon, uh, the bear, and so on. All the you know nor kind of the Norse pantheon, um, and so their offspring have their bloodlines, and they have some of those qualities. So, f but they're um, but they're hunted and used as commodities in this new world where um. The kind of humankind is rising up out of the ashes of this cataclysmic battle and building a new world and they hate the dead the dead gods because it was those gods that brought around the near destruction of the world so in turn they hate their offspring as well but they they so they enslave them basically they hunt they hunt them down they find them they enslave them and they use them in their um their quest for power so for example you in Bloodstone 1, you'll, you'll come across a Jarl, uh, an Earl or a King, who has a collection of berserkers um, that are thralled, enslaved to him. And these are guys who are descended from the Bear God. So they have the, that berserker blood in their veins. And um, they, they can prove quite unpleasant in a scrap. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the kind of world that, I, that I'm, I'm trying to build that feels very Norse, that's got all these nods to Norse mythology, Norse mythology, you know, with berserkers and um, uh, I, don't know, I don't want to give too much away, but, <laughs> but that, I mean, it feels like a lot of fun to me. It, it's very, it's a very character-driven novel. That I've cut down the PO, POV, so there's three main POVs. So, um, but it, it felt like it, it came out fairly tight and. Um, Hopefully you'll find the characters in the heart of it that, that drive it. Yeah, I mean, my only question there is, is it like you got like a target release date yet? Because it's, <laughs> that take my money on that. That sounds brilliant. Thank you, Mike. Um, it's coming out next spring. It's so kind of like that April, May-ish? Yeah, I think that's kind of what you do yeah. with, the, uh, with, the, with the blood and bone, right? It's like every, every April, May. That's right, yeah, yeah. So it's penciled in for them, and it's all on schedule. They've, I'm going to hand it in the draft. Um, February, the first edit's done, the copy edit's done, so really we're, we're just, we're on to cover art now, which is what we're discussing, um, I haven't seen any drafts on that yet, but that should be happening soon, and then it'll be the, um, the proof read through, try and catch out all those nasty typos, mm. and then, then really it's done, then the, the whole machinery for kind of marketing will start churning and the arts will go out, I guess. All right, well, since this will be the first series of yours that I'll be reading that is not complete, uh, yeah. I, I'm not trying to be that guy who's always asking about the next book, but will we be, do you have a plan to maybe do like one per year, like what Joe Abercrombie's doing with his first law sequels, where it's like every September he's putting out one? Are you, are you planning to write them all like that at once and release them like the same time each year? Um, I mean, no, I just, you know, like I said, with my writing, I just try and squeeze it in when I can. But I, I'm well on track. I'm... Um, I'm well into writing book two now, so uh, I'm hoping to have that done by um, well before winter. Well, well you hand, seem pretty hand. consistent with your schedule, so I'm not exactly worried about it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, hey, I hope to be able to secure an advance reader copy of that. Maybe I could be your video hype man, like Petrick has been your written hype word man, <laughs> written word hype man there. 
Uh, but uh, yeah. I don't, I don't have uh, anything else. I'm sure as soon as I hang up here, I'll think, oh man, I should have asked them about that. But I want to thank uh, uh, all the viewers for giving me some of these questions because like I said, when it comes to me questions like this, I would have just been like, hey, remember when you wrote Faith on the Fallen? You've been like, yeah, and I'd be like, yeah that was cool. <laughs> I, I'm really bad at these, these questions and stuff. But again, thank you while I was reading this, being so open to answer any questions and stuff like that that I had. I think that that no is just very, very unexpected from a, from, from a major published author to do that these days. And uh, it, it, it's really appreciated. And I think there's a lot of people that saw how much the engage, how engaged you were with the audience. And they think that they really uh, push this up. And I, as far as I know, I mean, I'm still, you know, like a 20,000 sub kind of channel. I'm not huge or anything like that, but I, I think myself, I've probably gotten a few hundred people to read this series. So I'm going to keep doing that to hopefully get them to do that. And, uh, yeah. and I'm going to keep working my way through this, which I figure I'll probably be done with in a, you know, less than a month here because uh, again, right. I just started the other day and I'm Beautiful. halfway done. It's, it's very, very easy to read. And I love it. Wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. I, you know, I'm just grateful to uh, have the invite to be, be on the show with you, Mike. It's great. I'm hey, really uh, thank you so much for coming on and again for writing such wonderful stories. And hopefully maybe when I'm done with this, we can have a chat about this because uh, I'm sure I'm going to have uh, lots of questions like, why are the Benalim such jerks? <laughs> <laughs> At least that's where I'm at right now. But uh, again, thank no you worries. so much. I really, really appreciate it. And, uh, and have yourself a great day. And try to stay, try to stay cool. Thank you, Mike. I'll do my best, mate. Thank you. Right. It's great talking to you. Cheers. Take care.